subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss an update from rao's is study circle join the only official telegram channel of rao's is study circle to get the relevant material and important updates hello and welcome to daily news simplified an answer to what why and how of newspaper analysis today we have taken up important news and articles that have featured in the delhi edition of the hindu newspaper dated 12th november 2022 topics that we are going to take up today are displayed on your screen let's begin the discussion our first discussion is based on this news which featured in the hindu newspaper page number 1 news is about sc order that releases all life convicts in rajiv gandhi assassination case now this word it hold importance in three respect first the use of article 142 by the supreme court that is extraordinary power to provide complete justice second issue which this news deals with is the federal structure because of long standing tussle between the center and state related to this case Now third issue is the issue of separation of power between various organs of government. Now if you will analyze the UPSC syllabus for GS paper 2 you can connect this news to various topic mentioned under the syllabus. For example functions and responsibilities of the union and the states issues and challenges pertaining to the federal structure separation of power between various organs and disputes redressal mechanism and institutions parliament and state legislature structure functioning conduct of business etc and structure organization and functioning of the executive and judiciary so in today's discussion we will look into various aspect of the pardoning power of the governor and the president we will look into why these power has been provided to them second what are these powers is there any other parallel power what is the judicial interpretation of such provisions we will also look into the brief timeline of this particular case and in last we will discuss the significance of this judgment so let's begin the discussion so the first question which is important for our discussion is why these powers have been provided to president and governor the objective is twofold first is to keep the door open for correcting any judicial error in the operation of law and the second is to afford relief from a sentence which the president or governor regards as unduly harsh so as you know article 72 deals with the pardoning power of the president whereas article 161 deals with the pardoning power of governor so let us have a look to the official text of the constitution to get a clear understanding of these two provisions now you can see here that article 72 deals with the pardoning power of the president while article 161 deals with the power of governor to grant pardon etc now the text says the president shall have the power to grant pardon reprieve respite or remission of punishment or to suspend remit or commute the sentence of any person convicted of any offense and offenses are in all cases where the punishment or sentence is by court martial second is in all cases where the punishment or sentence is for offense against any law relating to matter to which the executive power of the union extends now what is the meaning of executive power of the union now article 73 deals with the executive power of the union and the text reads as executive power of the union shall extend to the matters with respect to which parliament has power to make laws and to the exercise of such rights authority and jurisdiction as are exercisable by the government of india by virtue of any treaty or agreement now third case is in all cases where the sentence is a sentence of death provision 2 says nothing in sub clause a of clause 1 that is the court martial part 
shall affect the power conferred by law or any officer of the armed forces of the union to suspend remit or commute a sentence passed by a court martial while sub clause 3 says nothing in sub clause c that is sentence to death shall affect the power to suspend remit or commute a sentence of death exercisable by the governor now pay focus to these two lines they do not mention the term pardon so power to pardon any case related to these two laws that is that is sentence by court martial or case where sentence is a sentence of death the pardoning power lies exclusively with the president as you can read here in article 161 also that the governor of the state shall have the power to grant pardons reprieves respite or remission of punishment or to suspend remit or commute the sentence of any person convicted of any offence against any law relating to a matter which the executive power of the state extend what is the executive power of the state article 162 deals with that and it says executive power of a state shall extend to the matters with respect to which the legislature of the state has power to make laws so what is the basic difference between the pardoning power of the governor and the president the first is president can pardon sentences inflicted by court martial that is military courts and governor cannot second the president can pardon death sentences while governor cannot now pay attention that even if a state law prescribes death sentence the power to grant pardon lies with the president and not the governor however the governor can suspend remit or commute a death sentence but he cannot pardon the death sentence in other words both the governors and the president have concurrent power in respect of suspension remission and commutation of death sentence but not in case of pardoning the death sentence now what does these terms mean let us understand these terms now the pardoning power includes the following first is pardon pardon removes both the sentence and the conviction that means it completely absolves the convict from all sentences punishment and disqualification what pardoning does it completely absolves the convict second is commutation commutation denotes the substitution of one form of punishment for a lighter form for example a death sentence can be commuted to a life imprisonment remission means reducing the period of the sentence without changing its character suppose somebody gets a 10 year of rigorous imprisonment now in remission governor or president can reduce the duration of the sentence that is suppose they can make it 5 year without changing the character the rigorous imprisonment will remain as it is respite means awarding a lesser sentence in place of one originally awarded due to some special facts like physical disability or pregnancy of a woman etc and reprieve means stay of the execution of the sentence especially for the death sentences for a temporary period and it enables the convict to have time to seek pardon or commutation from the president or the governor now here we discussed the pardoning power of governor and the president as enshrined in our constitution however there is another set of statutory provisions in crpc which are parallel to these powers of the governor and the president so let's have a look at those statutory provisions so what is the difference between statutory power and constitutional power as we have already discussed that article 72 and article 161 of the indian constitution deals with the pardoning power of president and the governor respectively 
At the same time, the Code of Criminal Procedure that is CRPC provides for remission of prison sentences which means the whole or a part of the sentence may be cancelled. Under Section 432, the appropriate government may suspend or remit a sentence in a whole or in part with or without condition. This power is available to state governments so that they may order the release of prisoners before they complete their prison terms. Under Section 433, any sentence may be commuted to a lesser one by the appropriate government. However, Section 435 says that if the prisoner had been sentenced in a case investigated by the CBI or any other agency that probed the offence under a central act, the state government can order such release only in consultation with the central government. In the case of death sentences, the central government may also concurrently exercise the same power as the state government to remit or suspend the sentence. Now, though they appear similar, the power of remission under CRPC is different from the constitutional power enjoyed by the president and the governor. Under the CRPC, the government acts by itself. However, under Article 72 and Article 161, the respective governments advise the president or governor to suspend, remit or commute sentences. As they look similar and concurrent to each other, Supreme Court in various verdicts had provided the difference between statutory power and constitutional power. So as you have seen that Statutory power enables the government to act, whereas constitutional power enables governor and president to act. In both the cases, it is ultimately the decision of the government only, because the president and governor are bound by the advice of the council of minister. The Supreme Court has also made it clear that two are different sources of power. In Maruram v. Union of India case in 1980, the Supreme Court said, Section 432 and Section 433 of the Code are not a manifestation of Articles 72 and 161 of the Constitution, but a separate though similar power. Now this was also a landmark decision in that manner as it declared that the President and Governor do not independently exercise their power when disposing of mercy petition or pleas for remission or commutation, but only on the advice of the appropriate government. And this principle of binding nature of the advice of Council of Minister was reiterated in Kehar Singh case in 1988. Let us look into how Supreme Court examined the pardoning power of the President under different cases and let down the following principles. The first principle says the petitioner for mercy has no right to an oral hearing by President. Supreme Court also has said that President can examine the evidence afresh and take a view different from the view taken by the court. As you have seen in Maruram and Kehar Singh case, the power is to be exercised by the president on the advice of the cabinet. And same is the case with the governor of the state. Fourth is, the president is not bound to give reason for his order. Fifth is, the president can afford relief not only from a sentence that he regards as unduly harsh but also from an evident mistake. Supreme Court also held that there is no need for the Supreme Court to lay down a specific guideline for the exercise of power by the President. It has also said that the exercise of power by the President is not subject to judicial review except where the presidential decision is arbitrary, irrational, malafide or discriminatory. Now, Supreme Court also provided some ground for judicial review in Ipuru Sudhakar v. Government of Andhra Pradesh case. Supreme Court also observed that where the earlier petition for mercy has been rejected by the President, stay cannot be obtained by filing another petition. 
Now, having seen the various provisions and the interpretations relating to the pardoning power of the president and governor, let us briefly look into the timeline of this particular case that is Rajiv Gandhi assassination case. Now, as we know, on May 21, 1991, Rajiv Gandhi was assassinated at Sri Perambudur, Tamil Nadu. Now, another milestone came in 1992 when 41 accused, including 12 dead, were charged under TADA. And in 1998, the TADA court sentenced 26 accused to death, including Nalini and Perari Valan. In 1999, Supreme Court upheld death sentences of four, including Perari Valan and Nalini. In 2001, three death convicts, including Perari Valan, filed mercy pleas to the president. Now, in 2011, that is after 10 years, the then president Pratibha Patil rejected mercy petition. In the same year, Madras High Court stayed execution of three death row convicts. In 2014, invoking its power under Article 142, Supreme Court commuted death penalty for convicts, citing the delay in the justice. Now, another milestone came in 2022 when one more time using its power under Article 142, Supreme Court ordered release of Perari Valan and now other petitioner filed the petition for their release on the same ground as was invoked in the release of Perari Valan. Now, as you know, Supreme Court recently ordered the immediate release of six life convicts who have been in prison for more than three decades in the same Rajiv Gandhi assassination case. Now, let us look into the major outcome of this verdict. First, we will look into the criticism. Now, critics of this judgment are claiming it as a judicial overreach and a threat to the provision of separation of power. However, the Proponent or supporter of this judgment are claiming that this is judicial activism in which it Supreme Court in which Supreme Court has undone the injustice done by the delayed decision on the mercy petition of the convicts. Now let us discuss the significance of this judgment. Now the first significance lies in the fact that judgment held that the duty of the governor is to abide by the recommendations of the state cabinet while performing his functions, including the power to remit, suspend or commute sentences under Article 161. So, so once again, Supreme Court has reiterated what it has already said in Maruram versus Union of India case in 1980, and in Kehar Singh case of 1988 that the advice of the council of minister or the cabinet is binding on the governor and the president. Now the second significance lies in the fact related to this case in which governor had referred this mercy petition to the president. Now Supreme Court held that the governor need not have sent the matter to the president. Now, third significance is related to the fact that in this particular case, the referral to the president was lying for three years. And as we have already seen, the first decision on the mercy petition was taken in 10 year time. Supreme Court held that it is duty of governors to exercise their power in a time bond manner. In this respect, Madras High Court also noted that the provision of no time frame for governor to decide upon mercy pleas is provided because of faith and trust attached to the constitutional office and it said that it should not be used for arbitrary delays. Another important significance of this case lies as the judgment recognizes the power of the state in matters of remission and commutation etc. And lastly, the judgment upholds the human rights of the prisoners. Our next discussion is based on this article which featured on page number 10 of the Hindu newspaper. In this article, author has raised concern over failure of any Indian university to secure a rank under top 100 universities of the world. 
Primarily, author has attributed this failure to the lack of autonomy. Now, as you know, higher education system plays an important role for the country's overall development, which includes industrial, social, economic, and other sphere of life. Indian higher education system is third largest in the world. The role of Indian higher educational institutes such as colleges and universities in the present time is to provide quality based education in the field of education, research and innovation to empower youth for self sustainability. Now issues related to higher education system become important due to some recent observations as in spending on higher education as a percentage of government expenditure has stagnated at 1.3 to 1.5% since 2012. Ministry of Education continues to push higher education institutions to increase their intake capacity by 25%, basically in a push to implement the 10% quota for economically weaker sections. While the Ministry of Finance has sought to ban the criteria of new teaching post. There are just 8 Indian universities in the top 500 in the QS World University rankings. Now, from the perspective of UPSC mains examination, higher education is very important on two count. First, education has been a recurring theme in essay paper, while GS paper 2 mentions issues relating to development and management of social sector services relating to health, education and human resources. In this particular discussion, we are going to take a look at ideal learning outcomes, issues with higher education system and measures that can be taken to resolve such issues. So let's begin the discussion. Now you can use these pointer in write up of your essay. So what do you understand by ideal learning outcome? There are three ideal learning outcomes in higher education. First is to provide knowledge in the relevant discipline to the students. Secondly, since higher education students are on the verge of joining the workforce, it is expected that their education will also impart them with the skills needed for their job enterprises. Thirdly, students are expected to play a constructive role in shaping the society and the world at large using the values and ideals of a modern progressive society. The teaching learning process is expected to mold their character accordingly. So the character development is the third important ideal learning outcome. So the obvious question that arises is that on how many of India's higher learning institutions and the students within them are able to fulfill any or all of these ideal learning outcomes. Now, if we look at this topic from the perspective of GS paper 2, the issues with higher education system is of paramount importance. So here is the listing of various issues that are being faced by higher education system. Let's discuss them one by one. First is shortage of resources. Now it has been observed that bulk of the enrollment in higher education is handled by the state universities and their affiliated colleges. However, these state universities receives very less amount of grants in comparison to the central universities. Nearly 65% of the university grant commission that is UGC's budget is utilized by the central universities and their colleges, while state universities and their affiliated college get only the remaining 35%. Now there is another problem which is related to the funding with UGC itself. The UGC was allocated 4,900 crore in the financial year 2022-23. It was higher than what was allocated in financial year 2021 and 22 as 4,693 crore was allocated in financial year 2021 and 22. But problem lies in the stifled cash flow that has led to the delays in salary payments for deemed and central universities. Apart from this, the Higher Education Financing Agency, that is HIFA, which provides funding for all infrastructure loans to institutions, saw its budget 
reduced from 2000 crore in financial year 2020-2021 to meager amount of rupees 1 crore in 2021-22. to Instead, universities have been forced to take loans but have few avenues to tap them. Now, second important issue is low enrollment. According to All India Survey on Higher Education Report 2018-2019, the gross enrollment ratio in higher education in India is only 26.3% which is quite low as compared to the developed as well as some developing countries. Now third challenge lies in the issues of faculties and UGC gave two reasons for such vacancies. First is the young students don't find the teaching profession attractive. The recruitment process is long and involves too many procedural formalities. Second reason is lack of accountability for teachers. At present, there is no mechanism for ensuring the accountability and performance of professors in universities and colleges. This is unlike foreign universities where the performance of college faculty is evaluated by their peers and students. Poor infrastructure is another challenge to the higher education system of India. Particularly, the institutes run by public sectors suffer from poor physical facilities and infrastructure. In field of research also, there are several inadequacies. Universities lack focus on research in higher education institutes. The National Research Foundation, which was aimed to improve research infrastructures in university, has not yet been approved. There are insufficient resources and facilities as well as limited number of quality faculties to advise students. Most of the research scholars are without fellowship or not getting their fellowship on time, which directly or indirectly affects their research. Moreover, Indian higher education institutions are poorly connected to research center and to the industries. Now, outdated curriculum is another challenge which faces the higher education system in India. This obsolete curriculum is dominantly theoretical in nature and has low score for creativity. There is a wide gap between industry requirements and university's curriculum, which is the main reason for the low employability of graduates in India. Apart from the outdated curriculum, the quality of education is itself an issue. Ensuring quality in higher education is amongst the foremost challenges being faced in India today. A large number of colleges and universities in India are unable to meet the minimum requirement let down by the UGC and our universities are not in position to mark their place among the top universities of the world. The mismatch between the industrial demand and the curriculum that universities are following impacts the quality of education and, and keeps it below the requirement of the time. Now, education system in India also faces the challenge of low vocational component. From 61st round of NSSO survey that was held in 2004 and 2005 to 66th round of NSSO survey that was done in 2009 to 2010, the population in the age group of 15 to 29 years who had received formal vocational education reduced from 2.37 to 1.6%. And those who had received non-formal vocational education declined from 7.74% to 4.80%. Now let's discuss some point that has been highlighted by the article itself. Now according to the author of this article, Indian University face lack of autonomy and which is the main factor behind their poor ranking in world map. On the contrary, the best universities in the world are continuously sensitized about the importance of their autonomy and are trained and enabled to make their own decisions. The NEP regards academic and administrative autonomy essential for making higher education multidisciplinary and that teacher and institutional autonomy are a sine qua non in promoting creativity and innovation. The policy considers a lack of autonomy as one of the major problems of the higher education and promises to ensure faculty and institutional autonomy through a highly independent and empowered board of management, which would be vested with academic and administrative 
autonomy. So why do we need the autonomy? Now, according to the article, it will provide the very necessary academic freedom in order to design the curriculum in line with the demand of the industry. It will promote innovation and it will also promote research ecosystem in the universities. It will have a positive impact on gross enrollment ratio. It will help in weeding out the corruption and will definitely help in avoiding the red tapism. Now, in order to understand how the autonomy will help in achieving these targets, let us first look into the present regulation architecture in India. While the universities in India are established by law, either a central law or a state law, UGC acts as an overarching regulatory body at the university level. The colleges, on the other hand, are regulated by way of affiliation to universities. This way, the course fee, assessment criteria, admission criteria, etc. are regulated by the affiliated universities. At the course level, there are various technical professional councils that regulate the design and content of the course. So, as we mentioned that India follows a three-tier regulation architecture. First at university level, second at college level and third at course level. While most central and state universities are guided by the aforesaid regulations, there are number of institutions established outside the aforesaid regulatory purview. For the want of autonomy in their functioning, IITs and IIMs which are established outside the Indian university system are an example of this category. Now having discussed now having discussed the significance challenges and the points that are highlighted by the article regulatory structure let us go into the way forward or the measures to improve upon these challenges now for low resources mobilization of funds in state universities should be explored through other means such as endowments contribution from industry and alumni, etc. For vacancies, the recruitment process should start well before a post is vacated. In addition to make the profession of teaching more lucrative, faculty should be encouraged to undertake consultancy projects and be provided financial support for startups. For improving on the accountability account, a system of performance audit of professional based on the feedback given by their students and colleagues should be set up. Other inputs like research papers, publication by teachers should be added in the performance audit in due course of time. For the issue of lack of employable skills, identification of skill gaps in different sector and offering course for enhancing employability in them has been recommended. Some strategies in this regard can include Industry Institute Student Training Program, Industrial Challenge Open Forum, Long-Term Student Industry Placement Scheme and Industrial Finishing School. In the field of accreditation, it has been felt that accreditation of higher educational institutions need to be at core of the regulatory arrangements in higher education. Further, quality assurance agencies should guarantee basic minimum standards of technical education to meet the industry's demand for quality manpower. The National Board of Accreditation should act as a catalyst towards quality enhancement and quality assurance of higher technical education. Credit rating agencies along with reputed industries associations, media house and professional bodies should be encouraged to carry forward the process of rating of Indian universities and institutions. A robust rating system will give rise to healthy competition among the universities and will help improve their performance. The National Education Policy 2020 has sought to foster critical thinking and problem solving along with social, ethical and emotional capacities and dispositions. Enabling this will require an encouraging ecosystem with greater funding, autonomy and tolerance of universities. Without this, the talented Indian citizens will continue to escape abroad. Inspiration for our next discussion comes from this news which featured on page number 12 of The Hindu Newspaper.
News talks about China confirming that their president Z will attend G20 summit in Bali and will meet Biden and Macron. Now important international organization have been recurring theme in UPSC preliminary examination as well as mains examination. As you can see here in GS paper 2 it has been mentioned that bilateral regional and global grouping and agreements involving India and or affecting India's interest. Another subheading mentions important international institutions, agencies and their structure, mandate etc. Here in this discussion we will try to cover facts and information which are important from prelims as well as mains perspective. So let's begin the discussion. Now first and foremost what is G20? The G20 was formed in 1999 in the backdrop of the financial crisis of the late 1990s that hit East Asia and Southeast Asia in particular. It aims to secure global financial stability by involving middle income countries. Now here lies the significance. Together, the G20 countries include 60% of the world's population, 80% of global GDP and 75% of global trade. You can refer this map to identify the member countries and the guest countries which are painted in blue. Now let us look at the working of the G20. The G20 has no permanent secretariat. The agenda and work are coordinated by representatives of the G20 countries known as Sherpas who work together with the finance ministers and governors of the central bank. The primary mandate of the grouping is for international economic cooperation with particular emphasis to prevent future financial crisis across the world. From 1999 to 2008, the forum exalted from grouping of central bank governors and finance ministers to head of states. Having discussed the working of this grouping, let us look into the presidency and significance for India. Now the presidency of G20 rotates every year among members and the country holding the presidency together with the previous and next presidency holder forms the Troika to ensure continuity of the G20 agenda. Now this fact is important that is currently India holds the presidency. And why G20 summit presidency is an opportunity for India? Because it is cornerstone of new emerging world order. As India is part of Quad and SCO BRICS, the varying faction at world stage, because here it includes US, Japan and Australia, to which China look upon as a rival faction, while in BRICS, China and Russia are the active members. It is an opportunity in crisis to become the bridge of the divided world. Now second important fact is India is hosting the summit in Kashmir. It would be a direct message to world that India will again assert that Kashmir is an integral part of India. Now having seen the presidency and why it is important opportunity for India. Now having discussed why the presidency holds significance for India, let us look into the challenges which are facing the G20. Now this could become a forum for great power rivalry because presence of US, China and Russia in the aftermath of Ukraine crisis. At 2014 summit hosted by Australia, leaders adopted a plan to boost their economies by a collective 2.1% which they did not achieve. So there would be apprehension and skepticism regarding setting up of any new target. United States blocked a planned reference in the communique to the need to resist all forms of protectionism, a communique to which all its members agreed. In Argentina summit, the G20 members adopted a communique to which all its members agreed. However, this communique did not include issues like trade, climate change and migration, which were of utmost importance. Now, there is no enforcement mechanism in G20 grouping. The G20's toolkit ranges from simple exchanges of information and best practices to agreeing common measurable targets to coordinated action. It does not possess any enforcement mechanism. 
G20 has raised voice for urgent restoration of dispute settlement system to contribute to predictability and security in the multilateral trading system. Despite being a member of G20, US under Donald Trump had blocked the appointment to WTO appellate body. The new president Biden has yet not taken any action on this issue. Now some other challenges include that the targets set by G20 countries are not sufficient enough. As G20 countries agreed to raise IMF reserves with new SDR allocation of US dollar 650 billion, critics have argued that given the scale of financing challenge in emerging economy, it is not enough. As you have seen, it has no compliance mechanism. The decisions are based on discussion and consensus which culminates in the form of declaration. They are not legally binding. G20 members have failed to break the impasse on climate goal. As you have seen, they have not included climate related issues in their communique. Many countries disapproved of the idea of committing to keeping global warming level below 1.5 degree centigrade and phasing out coal. US, EU, Japan and Canada are few among them. Globalization is no longer a cool word and multilateral organizations have credibility crisis as countries around the world pick being G0 which simply means that no country is willing or able to set the international agenda. So let us look into the way ahead. As India will be hosting G20 and SEO summits, India will be central in outlining key priorities area. India can assert its political, economic and intellectual leadership which will have to address issues that help in cement the fault line in the world order. India's leadership could define the coming years and decades of global discourse and avenue of cooperation. Now this news featured on page number 10 of the Hindu newspaper. It talks about a recent study which was conducted by Pune-based Environment Institute and it has revealed that altitude plays role in the dietary habits of simians. Now what is simians? They are basically primates containing all animals traditionally called monkeys and apes. Now this study has revealed that difference in altitude has made a primate species in the same Himalayan habitat to choose between flowers and fruits as food options beyond their staple menu of leaves. Now this news might not be very important from the perspective of mains examination but it holds significance in terms of preliminary examination. As you will realize that in preliminary examination the syllabus mentions general issues on environmental ecology, biodiversity and climate change. And previously, UPSC has frequently asked questions based on important species which are found in India and abroad. For the reference in GS paper 3, the conservation is mentioned in the syllabus. So let's have a look on the pointers which are important from the perspective of the preliminary examination. Now here in this picture, you can see the species which is in news. That is Himalayan Grey Langur or the Chamba Sacred Langur. It is a colobine that means a leaf eating monkey. It is an endangered species globally. It is native to Indian subcontinent and their distribution is reported from Chamba region of Himachal Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistan and Nepal. Let us have a look on some other important primate species in India. Another one is golden langur. The IUCN status is endangered and is listed in Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act. That means the highest degree of protection is accorded to this species. It is found in a small region of western Assam and in black mountains of Bhutan. Another important species is lion-tailed macaque. The IUCN status is endangered and it is endemic to western ghats of India. This species has also been accorded the highest protection under the Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act. 